Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Vegan Proteins and Muscles by Brussels Radio. My name is Giacomo. And I'm Danny. And this is episode 114. If my timeline is right here, by the time this episode comes out, we will be headed to Fort Lauderdale for the Vegan Health and Fitness Expo, which I personally am super excited for. It will only have been our second time judging athletes on stage, and it is something that I have wanted to do for a very long time. I'm very, very interested to see what kind of physiques come out to compete. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, same here. And gosh, (laughs) Robert has, the three of us have been meeting spot to spot to spot for the past couple of months. It's kind of cool. It's like you get to be on tour with your friends instead of just being behind the screens, you know, doing your thing and just knowing that we're all working for the same thing. Like there is a colleague of ours that, I don't think you you've you two have met yet, right, Danny? The the um, I'm spacing on his name, but he's looking to become the first IFBB pro bodybuilder, and you could just see the passion in this man's eyes when you ask him. Well, I'm spacing out here because this past couple of months has honestly been a blur because he came to our booth, didn't he? Yeah, his name is John. He's um the vegan bodybuilder or something like that on Instagram. I can't, I can't remember the exact handle, but yeah. Yeah. I've met him. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly like what the true motivation is behind that, but I could tell like he is just, he's going for it, which is pretty cool. Robert will be there. We'll be there. It'll be like a Corinne will be there. Yeah. A reunion of the bodybuilding specific crew. I mean, it's an entire vegan health and fitness expo. So I suspect it's going to be, a little bit of a who's who of the vegan fitness scene, which it was in 2019 when we last did it. Anyway, it was a blast. Yeah, and we'll be speaking there too. And the expo itself is going to be at least twice as big size-wise. So it's going to be really interesting to see that all come together. We're going somewhere in May as well. We'll be in Vegas, I believe, right? No? Where's the idea expo, Danny? Los Angeles this year. It's in oh. Los Angeles. I think it's at the Anaheim Convention Center, which you just got home from last night. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. At the time of this recording, I got home from Expo. I was finally home for a couple of days, which is nice. And I can't remember if it's in actually Los Angeles or if it's in Anaheim, but it's a it's an Expo for fitness professionals. So for me, it's one of my absolute favorite Expos because it's not a consumer show necessarily. It's a show where everybody walking the floor is a coach or a personal trainer or a registered dietitian or a group fitness instructor. It, it's, I mean, we have our table there, so we're working at it, but it is just, it's a very fun one. Really great conversations. Worth traveling to? If you're in the fitness industry, yeah, absolutely. 100%. Maybe we'll see if, you there. If we weren't working there, I would try to go there as a, as a spectator, I guess. Yeah, totally. That's kind of the bummer of being behind the booth. Sometimes you don't get to really experience all that these expos have to offer. Mm -hmm. So it's like not just coming out for us to get to hang. Like you get so much out of these fitness expos. That one is just, yeah, just dripping with knowledge and classes too and presentations and all that, right? Oh, yeah. Like, for example, if you wanted to get certified in a certain fitness thing, Like, let's say you wanted to learn how to teach Zumba as a good example. Like, you could sign up for a certain morning class to go take the class to learn how to be a Zumba instructor. And by the end of, you know, a couple hours, you are a certified Zumba instructor and et cetera with nutrition stuff. Like, it's it's corrective exercise. It's it's a very cool expo. It's massive also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, you know what? Let's let's cut right to the chase, Danny. What are we talking about today? Today, I wanted to talk a little bit about how, although I believe that clean eating and the term clean eating and all of the dogma that surrounds clean eating sucks, like massively, massively sucks, I still think that there is absolutely room for us to do better, like eat better for our overall health. And I think that 10 years ago, when we started talking about flexible dieting, it was sort of blasphemous to imply that you could eat 
donuts and get ripped. Like that was absolutely unheard of. The clean eating movement was like at its peak in like the 20, 2008, 2010 era. And now, although I'm so happy to see flexible dieting incorporated by so many people and understood by so many people, I do sometimes think that folks have sort of gone too far in that direction and that in time we will see longer term health implications of eating too much like ultra processed food. And to you, our audience specifically, it's become problematic because of all of the foods that have gotten veganized, which for good reason, right? We want to create plant-based foods for everyone. We want to change the food supply on a fundamental level. But that means that we now have access to fatty burgers and fried chicken and fast food, like everywhere. 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 It, yeah, it's it's really fascinating. And like, I'm super grateful that those foods exist because I think without the existence of being able to go through a fast food drive through and easily make a plant-based option, I think way less people, way, way, way less people would even be interested in trying it. If the only option was salads and tofu like it was 20 years ago, way fewer people would be interested in trying out a plant-based diet or or having fewer animal-based products on their plate. And ultimately, for me, veganism is an ethical thing. So quite frankly, I don't care how people go vegan. I just want them to go vegan. <laughs> but as a health coach and a nutrition coach and a personal trainer, 20 years ago, well, I wasn't coaching people 20 years ago, but, you know, 10 or 12 years ago or whenever the heck we started this craziness, you would have to convince people like, guys, it's okay to have a Boca burger sometimes. Like if you go to a restaurant and all they have is a Boca burger, we can make this work. You're, you're okay. You're not an unhealthy person. We're going to be able to get through this. You can still get in shape. Like don't panic. Now it's like somebody can very easily have breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks inside or outside of the home be ultra-processed meals, and we're not going to see the improvements in someone's health that we used to almost automatically see when someone went vegan a long time ago. Now, make no mistake about it, what I'm not saying, (laughs) you can eat ultra-processed foods all the time and get jacked and ripped. Absolutely. There's no question about it. When it comes to fat loss and even muscle building, a macro is a macro is a macro. However, when it comes to what is happening inside of your body, not everything is created equally. And I think there are some people out there fooling themselves into thinking that if the calories and the macros are correct at the end of the day, that their health is still going to remain intact. No, no, no. Your six pack will, (laughs) your six pack will remain intact. But that does not mean that like internally you're doing the best job that you could. Right. And becoming less healthy and arguably unhealthy over time while looking a certain way, in my opinion, is a career ender as far as your interests to pursue whatever you're doing as an athlete because it takes you longer to recover your Mm -hmm. performance like you can grit your way through it but physiologically your body is not going to respond the same way to processed food that it's going to respond to nutrient dense whole foods well certainly not in large quantities and certainly not in the long run like i think that the dose really makes the poison here and you know that's true of anything you can drink water till you die. You can eat so much broccoli that it's bad for you and causes you GI distress. Like, everything comes down to the dosage and the frequency and the length of time, right? Like, how anybody who's getting a little bit older is recognizing, oh, I can't, I can't eat exactly the same as I could when I was in my teens or my 20s. Or if you're 
you know, up in your 60s or something, you probably recognize, oh, I can't get away with the foods I was able to eat when I was in my 30s and still like have a good night's sleep, for example. And then the other thing is that your body starts to ask for what you have fed it as of recent. So that can become addicting because Mm -hmm. let's say for two months you're eating like crap. Now it's hard to not eat like crap and Mm -hmm. it's not even necessarily psychological. It's the fact that like literally your gut is desiring the same kind of food that it's been breaking down for the past couple months, even if it's crappy. Yeah. And, and I also think, you know, a lot of these foods are designed to be hyper palatable. It's a, it's a tremendous amount of salt, fat, and sugar crammed into this tiny little package that it's just like, Ooh, you eat it and your whole brain lights up like crazy. Like, of course you're going to want that. You're, we're not, nobody is really above it. <laughs> like it's delicious. Like it's delicious for a real, it's just delicious. And then when you have it, you want more of it later, you know, unless it makes you physically feel bad, in which case you might be able to sort of logic your way out of that. But, you know, I guess what I'm saying is you can be well fed and undernourished at the same time. And what I mean by that is you can have plenty of calories and still develop vitamin deficiencies or mineral deficiencies or, you know, gut microbiome problems or, you know, not be getting enough fiber. You can be perfectly well fed on paper, but still be undernourished. So I will say that even though I feel I can do pretty much anything with my body with food at this point, do you feel the same way? Aesthetically, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The idea that there are food scientists and the food supply chain in general wants to make stuff taste so good and be so appealing in every possible way that I can't say no, that scares me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, even brands that I absolutely love, even companies I absolutely love, even foods I absolutely love, I'm like, sometimes when I stop to think about it, I'm like, damn. Like, in one sense, how can you blame them for wanting to make food taste good? Like, how could you blame a food company for for that? In another sense, it's like, ah, you almost can't blame yourself. And you kind of have to just be a little cognizant of the fact that we live in a world where everything is meant to taste delicious. And that can actually get you into trouble. Yeah. One thing, I, when I very first got into, like, fitness and wellness and health and all of that, I mean, I did everything wrong. <laughs> if I could go back, I would do so many things differently. But one of the things I did was I very quickly hopped on the clean eating bandwagon. Like, very quickly. Was like, oh, that's the answer. Like, I just need to always eat clean all the time. And the number of mental health problems that came from that mindset is astronomical. So I still stand firmly on the hill that the whole concept of clean eating sucks massively. But I did find that when I was basically forcing myself and restricting myself into eating nothing but whole unprocessed foods, tons of fruits and vegetables, I did my palate changed. My palate did change to enjoy those foods more. Of course, you know, you I could only maintain that for so long before I sort of snapped and started binge eating on all of these things that I had told myself were off limits for the last year. It was a nightmare. So I'll talk more about that in a minute. But once I started eating those things that had been off limits, you know, it's almost like I had like mentally detoxed from those foods. I don't mean detoxed like physically, but like my brain had mentally kind of detoxed away from those foods so that when I finally had it again, it was even more delicious than I remembered it being. And I needed even more of it to like satisfy some craving kind of those cravings were not satisfiable, but there, there is something to be said for the whole point of what I'm saying is when you have more fruits and vegetables and whole foods, it, you might not like it at first, but your palate will change for those things after a while. And of course, learning how to cook is always helpful too, because then you know how to add all kinds of flavors to them. So it's a double edged sword. Hopefully I'm using that properly here. I've been known to misuse <laughs> What what is a double to choose sword? poor to choose the wrong metaphors and make bad analogies? But I'm gonna hopefully I'm right here in that. In one sense, it's important to remove the food guilt and to not 
restrict yourself in another sense, you're almost encouraging introducing foods into your diet, if you will, that you can't stop overeating or overindulging on. So I think the problem with what I was doing back then was the mindset in general. If all you're allowed to eat is clean food, what is everything else? It's dirty food. It's bad food. And you are dirty and bad and unclean when you eat it. The, the entire mindset around there being good foods and bad foods just sets you up to feel guilty when the inevitable happens that you eat something that is not clean. It's going to happen, guys. I don't care how clean you're trying to eat. Eventually, you're going to eat a piece of bread it's going to happen <laughs> or you're going to have a french fry or somebody's going to go out of their way to make you vegan chocolate chip cookies and you're going to be such an asshole if you don't eat them that you're going to eat them and then what do you feel just tremendous guilt for being dirty and unclean and bad and a failure and nobody ever like hated themselves into being better And that it's just fuel to sort of, like, hate yourself. So I don't think that there's anything bad with incorporating more whole, unprocessed foods into your diet. I even hesitate to use the word healthy because I think to call, like, should we even be calling foods healthy or unhealthy? Because I think even what we think about as really unhealthy foods in certain situations can be exactly what somebody needs at that moment. I think, you know, I used the example of my grandfather in one of the last episodes we recorded. He was starving to death. Anything that he could eat was a positive, even if it was cream pies. You know, that was still what he needed in that moment. Right then, that was a much healthier choice for him than steamed carrots. You know, So, I don't know. I even struggle with, like, this is healthy and this is unhealthy. Foods are more nutritious. Some foods are less nutritious. Some foods are more calorie-dense. Some foods are less calorie-dense. So even though I I would encourage people to drop the good food, bad food, or I'm being good or I'm being bad mindset around food, like, there is still an element of common sense that I think people need to employ. That, like, guys, fruits and vegetables, good. Good things to add. Always good things to add. Nuts, seeds avocados, tofu, tempeh. These are great things to incorporate into your diet and they're only going to help you systemically be healthier. Yeah. I mean, obviously you can still eat fruits and vegetables in a way that is unhealthy, but that's a different conversation for a different day. But hopefully fresh, healthy fruits, vegetables, grains, seeds, et cetera, et cetera, making sure that that makes up a good chunk of what you eat on the regular. It doesn't have to be like that Mm routine-wise. However, it should be something that you always look to get back to, right? And ideally, over time, you spend more and more time in that zone, in that flow, where that is your routine, right? And I think that is a long-term approach to being a healthy person mentally as opposed right. to you are what you eat physically. Yeah, the the guilt, the guilt and sort of mental punishment you put yourself through for eating quote unquote junk food, I think is a lot more unhealthy than occasionally having a piece of birthday cake and then just letting it go and getting back to what you were doing, you know? If you're anguishing your way through the office birthday party, like white knuckling your way through not eating whatever treat they've brought, and then you're thinking about it for the rest of the day, just feeling like you missed out on something. Like, oh, I really wish I could have had that. And, you know, you're trying to eat your apple, and you're trying to eat your salad, and you're trying to eat your almonds, and it is just not scratching the itch. So then you go to the grocery store and buy an entire pack of cookies and eat the whole thing. Probably should have just had that piece of birthday cake that you actually wanted earlier in the day. But that's a bad example. That's probably not vegan office birthday cake, but you get what I'm saying, right? I do, actually. And not every time, but 9.5 times out of 10, that is the correct answer in that kind of scenario, right? Mm -hmm. But I would wager that 
only half of the time would you make that choice? And then what are you left with consequence-wise? Yeah. So while I do think that most people can get away with eating a good amount of highly processed food for quite a long time, there can be health things happening on the inside that you're not even aware of because it's like a slow boil for so long that you don't even realize that you're starting to feel a little bit worse. You're starting to feel a little bit more fatigued. You're recovering a little bit slower and you're just chalking it up to age when really, you know, eating really high amounts of added sugar, like, do we really need to tell you that's not great for you in the long term? Or, you know, one one that we probably do need to say is like really high amounts of omega-6s, which are vegetable oils, compared to the intake of omega-3s, that is going to cause some inflammation. And anytime people hear the word inflammation, they freak out. Acute inflammation is important. That's how you build muscles, my friend. But chronic, low-grade, systemic inflammation is terrible for you. It's a terrible, terrible thing. All sorts of health problems can sort of start there. And three of the worst possible things that you could do to give to become a person that has chronic low-grade systemic inflammation are eating a lot of sugar, eating a lot of omega-6s, and not eating much fiber. So those three things compounded over years will have consequences in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. I want to lighten up the conversation a little bit. What are your favorite processed foods, Danny? I, uh, man, that's... (laughs) Okay, I'll tell you a really fun one sure. that I had recently. Shebang potato chips. Okay, so shebang potato chips are o- <laughs> Thank you. only available in one place, and it's prison. <laughs> so you went to prison, <laughs> no. and you stole these from someone, I did, and you got out, I did and you not. made it. I did not. Okay. This is a stranger Sorry. story. So... Uh, I heard about these potato chips watching a YouTuber called Jessica Kent. She's great. I thoroughly enjoy her channel. And she mentioned these shebang potato chips and how they were such a weird, unique flavor. And then I looked them up and they happened to be vegan. You can buy these on Amazon for like 6 or $7 a bag, but like I can't bring myself to do that. But the only store that you can actually buy them in is commissary in prison. And I just so happened to have a good friend who was in prison. Uh, she's out now. And she brought me a bag of shebang potato chips. And holy crap, they are so good. They like almost hurt to eat because they're so seasoned. So good. Okay, so there's your weird fun fact about me today. I don't know if it's my favorite processed food. My favorite, favorite, favorite food probably of all time is cake followed shortly by popcorn. What was that like? Dutch thing that you made that I was like, this is so ridiculous. I don't even know if I could eat this right now. It doesn't feel safe. You made it on Christmas. It it was like a pie or what what was that? It was for breakfast on Christmas morning. A custard pie? No, Dutch apple pie or something like that. Oh, it was a baby apple pancake. That thing. I I took like one bite of this and I'm like, something about this doesn't feel right. This is just ridiculous ridiculously rich i don't need to experience this on my palate it was crazy in another universe in a separate dimension i am a little chubby vegan who owns a bakery and reviews movies and (laughs) that's what i do with my time (laughs) i had a flat out war with myself with that dutch baby baby apple pancake there's nothing dutch about it i had a war with myself with that baby apple pancake and i'm like I'm used to a Mediterranean diet. (laughs) Everyone that eats this, like, that's why. What's wrong with y'all? Like, get the stick of butter and just get rid of it. I was not having it. I I went totally over the edge, but I still indulged. It was pretty interesting. So I think the point Giacomo was trying to get at here is that I certainly do enjoy me a good processed food. Like, I do. I, I... I don't think I'm, like, above any of these foods. I like them. I enjoy them. I indulge in them from time to time intentionally like that's the key i don't just my you know i don't just walk into the store and grab any old bag of potato chips off the shelf no no i specifically want the prison potato chips that i'm probably only going to have a couple times in my whole life and then that's it or 
very specific things I'll make or have at very specific occasions. And then outside of that, I really do try to eat predominantly whole, colorful foods, even when I'm not always in the mood for them, because I'm a goddamn adult and I need to take care of myself. Give me an enormous sized pie and I will devour that thing. That's my favorite pie. Nothing, nothing fancy, nothing special, but just like just pizza, pizza. That's it. Pizza and ice yeah, cream. I keep it simple. Ice cream. Yeah. I mean, there's really not a lot of foods that I don't like, except for cilantro, which can go straight to hell where it belongs. <laughs> yeah, I got to sneak the cilantro in when Danny's not around or she'll come for me. Ugh, I can't even smell it. It's so disgusting. Hey, listeners. Hope you have been enjoying this episode. Interested in learning more about muscle building as a vegan? I'm hosting a free live webinar where you'll learn all about my five most important keys to building muscle as a vegan. You'll want to sign up for it because if you don't, there won't be any other way to have access to this valuable information in the webinar. Go to the link in the show notes and reserve your spot as spots are limited. And I hope you'll join us on Thursday, April 13th at 6 p.m. Eastern. You'll have a chance to ask questions as well. And we will even give you a bonus vegan proteins pre-workout guide for attending. Looking forward to seeing you there. Okay, so what what do you do? What do you do if you're a flexible dieter, an IIFYMer, and you're hearing this and you're like, oh crap, that's me. I'm the one that's eating all the processed foods and not getting enough fruits and veggies and blah, blah, blah. I think that it's a good idea to put guidelines on this. You know, you're already a macro counter. You're already tracking all the stuff that you take in. You're tracking your carbs, your calories, your fats, your proteins. Here are a couple of guidelines that I would recommend. One, set a fiber goal. Set a fiber goal for yourself. 20 to 25-ish percent of your carbohydrates should be coming from fiber. And yes, count them as carbohydrates. None of this net carb bullshit. Um, so let's say you're eating 250 grams of carbs. You know, if you can get 50 grams of fiber in the day, awesome. You're doing awesome. Now, if you normally get 10 grams of fiber in the day, let's walk this up slowly so you don't get like the gassiest belly on earth. But fiber, I think we're going to find out that in time, like fiber might be the closest thing to a magic bullet that we've ever seen. That's my prediction. So yeah, 20 to 25% of your carbs coming from fiber. Shoot for that. And the other thing is give yourself a number of calories, you know, per day or per week or however you want to do it, that you're going to allow yourself to just eat whatever you want with those calories. So, you know, this is going to require some self-reflection. <laughs> if 80% of your calories are coming from processed food, right now that are really high in sugars and oils and this and that, you know, maybe you cut it down to 50. If it's like 30% are coming from that, maybe you try to cut it down to 20. Um, you know, still don't, don't try to cut it down to zero because you're going to pay for that in the long run. You are, but give yourself a calorie limit, you know, so if it's 20, if you're eating a 2000 calorie diet and you give yourself 20% of your daily calories can come from more fun foods, let's say that's 400 calories a day that can come from more fun foods. It doesn't have to be that way. However, that is always an option for right. you on the table. I think that's where people miss the mark. They mm -hmm. try to get so calculated with things. And in my opinion, that's a whole other problem that has nothing to do with food. And that's more of a mindset a shift. control that, thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're not, no one's above that. And sometimes you need to go that route. But to do that all the time, yeah. let it go. Well, I mean, I'm just saying set it as sort of like a ballpark. Yeah, you know, exactly. I think that can be really helpful. The last thing that I want to say that I probably should have said earlier in the conversation is what is a processed food is going, this was the problem with clean eating. Even 20 years ago, I remember some people would tell me I couldn't have tofu because it had soy in it and it wasn't good for me. It wasn't, it wasn't a clean food. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? Of course it is. So what is considered a clean food or even an unprocessed food is going to vary a lot from person to person. Somebody might say only edamame is an unprocessed food and tofu is processed. I would disagree with that personally. I 
tend to think of processed foods as as more of a process than just that. <laughs> Generally, some sort of a chemical process, which I guess with the, the salt in the tofu that they separate it with, it's kind of a chemical process. But my point is, use your best judgment. Don't try to look up something. Oh my God, is this, is this a processed food? Start Googling to find out if something is or isn't a processed food. Like, you know, you know in your gut for the most part, if something is or isn't, you know, a highly ultra processed food. That is mostly what I'm talking about. It's like the ultra processed foods. Mostly. I do think sometimes we get confused by scientific language, the way things are classified food wise. And we become paranoid because we don't know that like the scientific name for a vitamin is it's just a vitamin. You know what I mean? Right. Oh, you're totally right. Or just stuff that's packaged. You see something in a package and like, if it's in a package, it's processed. It's like, well, not necessarily. It's just shelf stable. Yeah, I'm not. Well, sometimes. Sometimes. What, sometimes what makes it shelf stable is stuff that is highly processed. Right. Like, like um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like trans fats. What, what is the word? Hydrogenated. Mm. Hydrogenated mm-hmm. fats. That I would say anything with a hydrogenated oil in it is, in fact a processed food but like seriously what are you supposed to do make everything from home you tell me how what percentage of you the listeners here like what percentage of you can actually make all your food at home all the time and still meet your needs as an athlete 25 percent, maybe like is it that realistic to avoid a couple of preservatives to make something shelf stable because you need to make your protein at home you know i'm not talking about a couple of preservatives when i think preservatives i'm thinking more of like salts and things that keep stuff shelf stable i'm thinking hydrogenated oils Mm -hmm. you know shelf stable uh, cookies or crackers or breads in order to keep those with a shelf life that they have which is like year sometimes they have to have hydrogenated oils in them which in my opinion that might be the only food that i will put my foot down and say no ma'am that one is just bad for you It's just bad for you. Now, again, if you're starving to death, I'd rather you have that than nothing. But there are no health benefits of hydrogenated oils other than a very dense calorie package. Which has its place because sometimes hyperpalatable food, to your point earlier in this conversation, it can actually be a good thing because it can encourage you to eat, depending on your circumstances. No? I'm I'm still going to sit here and say trans fats are pretty much always going to be bad for you. Okay, fair enough. Which well, I guess is I what hydrogenated argue. oils are. So, no, you, I mean, you, you make a good point. If someone is not eating, I would rather they eat something that comes in a package than eat nothing at mm. all. I can't tell you the number of 20, 25 year old men. I almost said boys, but at 25, you're certainly not a boy. Mm. I'm just old. Uh, <laughs> 25 year old men who feel like they're really skinny, they can't gain weight. And then I'm like, okay, well, what are you? what are you eating? And then they send me their food journal and it's like, they're having oatmeal with berries for breakfast and big ass salads for lunch. And I'm like, okay, we need much denser food in here because you're just like filling your stomach with volume. It's no wonder you can't get enough calories. So very easy ways to do that are hyper-processed foods that are on the shelves that are pre-packaged like cookies and crackers and things like that. But you can It's fine if you start there, but you can get smarter about it. You can find things like granolas that are really, really dense in calories, but they're not loaded with these things that make them harder on your body in the long term. I'll also add that if you're somebody who needs to eat a ton of calories in the day in order to gain weight, 20% of a ton of calories is still quite a lot of calories. So you still have lots of wiggle room even within that guideline of like having 20% of your calories come from more fun foods. So it's a, I don't think it's a black and white. I think that it is definitely a gray area, but I do think that there are some people who have fallen far down the IIFYM, meaning if it fits your macros, anything goes rabbit hole and there's also a lot of new vegans that don't have the experience that we had of being basically forced into a predominantly whole food plant-based diet just because of the year that we went vegan people get to skip right over that and go straight into the i can have a sausage egg and cheese 
Eggo waffle sandwich for breakfast, and it's completely vegan. And it's like, ethically, I'm on board. Heck yeah. But like, if you want to be healthy for a really long time, those things ought to be occasional treats, not your daily breakfast. All right, moving on to our question and answer segment. Is it normal to not feel spent after lifting workouts? I'm definitely walking out of the gym with my arms or legs feeling like jelly, but my heart rate doesn't get elevated much and I don't feel tired. Feeling spent as in, so the question here is you are lifting and you're physically taxed, like you're feeling like Dom's coming for you within the next couple of days. But mentally, you're just not – you're not feeling that physiological fatigue is what I'm hearing. Well, their heart rate is not getting elevated while they work out. Hmm. Well, the, But their arms and legs are feeling like jelly when they leave. Are hmm. they pushing hard enough? Like is that normal? Well, I find that you become more cardiovascularly fit the longer that you've been training – how lean are you? That's something to consider as well. Your heart works harder the more weight that you're carrying. So there are a couple of variables to consider there. I don't find it alarming or concerning that your heart isn't working super duper hard, or at least maybe your heart is just working efficiently, I should say, while you're training, as opposed to you not putting the right kind of intensity into your training, because you're looking for a hypertrophic response, I'm assuming, right? Because that's typically who we speak to. But that's another important thing to consider. What kind of training are you doing? If you're powerlifting, I'd imagine your heart's probably going to be pumping because even though you're not doing anything that's super cardio-like, it you, you really got to push to be that powerful when you're lifting. Um, for a hyper trophic response not so much and honestly it could even put you in a position where your heart is working more efficiently and then what are you doing outside of training and how much weight are you carrying on your frame so these are the things that i consider in response to your question in terms of a direct answer to are you lifting with enough intensity that is more of a loaded question and i would look to other things to measure that I would make sure that you're not taking too long of a rest in between your sets. You know, if you're if you're like chit chatting or hanging out with friends or like looking at your phone or like listening to something and you're like resting two three minutes at a clip in between sets, you're not lifting with enough intensity. If you're too focused on moving perfectly because you want to move well, you're probably not lifting with enough intensity. If you're not focused on progressive overload, meaning trying to get to a place where you're lifting more reps with each set over the course of time, you're not lifting with enough intensity. And sometimes you just got to go in there with like, you know, with a vengeance, like I'm going to go here and I'm going to just slam some weight around, like get worked up. You know what I mean? Not don't get so worked up that you wind up hurting yourself because like you're going to twist and tweak your body in some way. But like there should be like some inner, some inner, uh, I don't want to use the word rage, but like you should be going in there looking to just sling some weight around. And sometimes giving yourself a little kick in the butt like that, in my opinion, could be just what the doctor ordered as far as intensity goes. This question's for you, Danny. I have crackling sounds without pain in my knees when I stand up from a squat or in a crouching position. My doc cleared it as normal, but I'm curious if I can get rid of it because I'm experiencing this after leg routines consistently. Okay. So I have this too, actually. It was really funny when my brother was doing our, like filming our stuff for social media, I'd be demonstrating a squat or something in the basement and he's filming it and he's like, oh, is that your body? <laughs> because my knees crack so much every single time I stand up and they always have, it doesn't hurt at all. My hip straight up pops, like a big loud pop every time I do a lying leg raise. It sounds disgusting, but it doesn't hurt. It's just a little bit uncomfortable. Anyway, popping noises in the knee joints are usually caused by just gas bubbles and fluids moving through the joint. So 
it's it's perfectly normal if it doesn't hurt. To my knowledge, there is no way of getting rid of it. It's just something that you have to get. You just pop the headphones in, turn the sound up. You don't have to listen to it. It's okay. But in most cases, you know, if it's not accompanied by pain um, or discomfort, it doesn't require any treatment. But if that popping noise does have pain or swelling or stiffness, you should seek medical attention. So that is, I wish I had a better answer for you. It's, it's annoying and it sounds gross, but it's totally a normal thing to have happen. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Vegan Proteins Muscles by Brussels Radio. If you've been enjoying this podcast, it would mean the world to us if you left us a review on whatever platform you're listening to it on. It really helps get the show out there. If there's anything that you would like to hear from us, come to veganproteins.com. Click the contact button. Ask us to cover a specific topic or if you have a question you want answered in the Q&A, shoot it to us there. You can also join our free Facebook group, Muscles by Brussels Radio, where we have challenges and questions and an awesome community. And you can always find us on all the social media platforms as well at Vegan Proteins, at Muscles by Brussels, and at I Am Just Athena. Anyway, thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Danny. And I'm Giacomo. And we'll talk to you later. Stay-